start the recording on this thing. Okay, so if you go here, if you type this address, it'll go to this page here. And when you're here, um, all this, the information from previous small room in production conference is gonna be there. But since 2012, we got videos in there, presentations. These are the ones for this year. Uh, you can select, you can download them, you can share them with your friends. Um, so it's it's pretty straightforward. Everything's organized by our webmaster, Bam Gross, uh, that she's helping us with, with this thing. So anyway, remember, uh, if you have any issues accessing them, you can also um, ask us uh, at the, at the uh, local extension agent uh, where this information is at and we can we can get you that information all right maybe um maybe you can put the link in the in, in the, the chat, chat box of course yeah. that's that's my next move um anyway that's where it resides after we're done with the program i would uh implore you to take a couple of minutes to fill out our evaluation, which uh, uh, you can find in this address here, which I'm going to also share with you in the chat box so you don't have to come back and type everything up, of course. And um, that's gonna be it. Uh, you can follow us at Facebook or uh, YouTube. Our previous two sessions are uh, already in, in YouTube, uh, in our YouTube channel, so. Uh, so you know where to find them. Okay. Um, I think we are good to go. So Dr. Cabrera, your time is, uh, oh, before you start, I wanna introduce Joe Walter. He's a Brevard County Extension uh, Livestock Agent. And we have Tim Wilson with us as well. He's the St. John's County Extension Livestock Agent or Ag Agent and County Extension Director. Uh, so he's got a, lot, a long title. That means that he's got a lot of responsibility, but a short amount of pay, right? Anyway, um, so thank you again for being here on time. And uh, now, Catalina, you can go uh, and, and, and start your lecture. Okay. Just one second because I wanted to go to a link and I don't know if it's going to, I think here. There you go. Hello, this one. So, I guess not. Right there. Okay, can you see the presentation? And then let me move you guys to this side of the screen. Okay. All right, so today we are going to talk about kidding and lambing management. Um, and I'm going to basically uh, connect a little bit things that we discussed yesterday since they are all um, related. So we're gonna start with kind of like what are our objectives. So regardless of what the production system you have, um, what your goals are, you most likely are interested in having babies, um, whether because you're going to raise them to sell them for 4-H or for FFA, or because you're going to sell them for meat, or because you are interested in that dough to start producing milk. So in any case, what we were discussing yesterday is that we are going to put a lot of effort and we are going to do a big investment on making sure that these females get pregnant. So that's the first thing that we, we were discussing yesterday. So we are planning a year ahead. We are investing in nutrition. We are keeping an eye on, on animals. We are maybe investing in the genetics of a male. We are maybe investing on a veterinarian that is going to come and look at the semen. So after all of that investment is done, what we need to make sure is that we are gonna keep them pregnant, right? So our first goal is to get them pregnant. 
our second goal is to keep them pregnant. And then our third goal is to make sure that the dam and the babies are going to survive. So we are not gonna let them die. And finally, you're going to make sure that both females, males, and your babies are gonna either thrive in your production or for the case of the kids, they are going to grow big and tasty. They're going to be going for consumption or that they are going to be good producers in whatever other operation, whether it's in your operation, staying as uh, replacements or if you are selling them as stock. Um, so today we are going to focus a little bit more in the two and third point. So in how we are going to keep them pregnant and how we are going to prevent that we have issues that are going to cause death, death either in the mother or in the babies. So we did touch a little bit on this topic uh, yesterday. I was mentioning that pregnancy diagnosis, although it's not commonly done by all the producers has a lot of advantages. And so I want to, to discuss that a little bit further. Um, so a couple of reasons why pregnancy diagnosis is important is one, it's going to allow you to make decisions. So once you find out after your breeding season, who got pregnant and who didn't get pregnant, you're going to be able to make decisions. And decisions are gonna go from things as simple as, okay, you know, I gave this you a chance for the second time and last year she didn't lamb and now this year she's not pregnant. I'm not gonna wait until lambing season to find out that she didn't lamb again. This is maybe four months ahead of that that I'm going to find out that she did not get pregnant. And so maybe at that point she needs to leave my herd and I didn't feed her for four more months. So that's a decision point that you can make if you do a pregnancy diagnosis early on. Another example will be if you have a client that might be interested in buying pregnant animals because they want them to be born in their farm. So at this point, if I find out that these three goats are pregnant, I can call my client and say, okay, look, I have three pregnant females confirmed pregnant that I can sell you. So it adds value to the sale that you are doing. So this is another advantage. Um, and the other thing that it will allow you to do is to start preparing for lambing and for kidding. So if you now find out that 10 out of your 15, let's say that's not a very good example in terms of like, that's not a good pregnancy rate, but let's say that you said that you find 10 of your animals are pregnant, then you know how many lambings are or how many kidding you're gonna have. So you can prepare accordingly because now you know what number is truly going to kid or lamb in your place. And so in that idea from all of the other things that we were talking about in terms of preparing and planning, I know how many those I have to feed during that pregnancy. I know how many animals I'm going to have to be looking for lambing or for kidding. So all of that is things that are going to um, help, being helped by the fact that you are going to do a pregnancy diagnosis and you know who is pregnant. Um, I listed here at the top also like the pregnancy length. And so it's important that if you're going to do a pregnancy diagnosis, you do it at the end of your breeding season, calculating that the earliest that we are going to find that pregnancy is 30 days. So you could do an early pregnancy check, let's say two months into your breeding season, but you might be missing pregnancies that are too early to be found. So the recommendation if you're going to pre-check only once is to do it 30 days from the end of your breeding season. There are a couple of different methods um, for pregnancy diagnosis. One of them is abdominal palpation. Other people call them bolotment. So basically some people will have done it enough that they feel comfortable realizing that the animal is pregnant just by basically bolotting the abdomen of the animal, and then they're gonna feel the fetus basically hitting them back. So that's a way that some people does pre check, but it's not very accurate. And the other thing is that you will not be able to diagnose anything that is less than four months. So really you're just gaining one month in the diagnosis. Um, there are a couple of different uh, ways that you could pregnancy uh, diagnose through blood samples. The one that is probably more relevant and more, let's say, accurate will be the um, blood test that is looking for a protein that is released by the embryo. 
and that one will be uh, the commercial name is Bioprint. So here I have a picture for it, and there is the web page if you want to go and look into it. Um, it has advantages and it has disadvantages. Uh, you could do early prep checks at 30 days. You need to learn or to know how to get blood out of your animals. But if you're able to get blood out of your animals, you collect it and you can send it to the lab. There are different labs located in different areas, and then they will return back um, to you with a diagnosis of whether that animal is pregnant or not. Um, and the other option that you have is the ultrasound. Uh, there are a couple of things that that differ between using the blood test and the ultrasound, and I'm going to discuss a little bit the advantages of, of the ultrasound. Um, but not talking bad about bioprint, we have a lot of producers that, that use bioprint and they are very happy and it's what is more convenient for them. Um, so it is definitely a, a possibility and a, a resource. But let's talk about some of the advantages of um, using ultrasound. So ultrasound is done um, fairly fast. Here I'm going to show you a quick video of some of our students doing ultrasound here in the ship at the university. Uh, so basically what we do is we use this transducer that is gonna go in the right side of the abdomen um, of the animal. In the case of sheep, that area where we ultrasound is woodless or hairless. So we don't have to clip. In the case of goats, sometimes we have to clip the area to have a better contact to the abdomen. And then we just use lube or something else that helps us conduct the image and we look in the screen. This is one old ultrasound that we have. It's, it's an oldie but a goodie, so we keep using it because it's uh, very reliable and we have good images with it. But we also have some other um, more modern equipment that we can actually see it from picture on, on our phones. So you can see here, somebody is just holding the animal and then the other student is putting pressure in the abdomen. And then here you can see in the screen that the first thing that we are seeing is that we have this black content that is basically equivalent to fluid. So this is already sort of like promising because we see fluid within the uterus. And then in that moment, she has found the fetus. So here you have to trust me, if you're not familiar with ultrasounds, but basically what we have here is the uterus. Within the uterus, there is the placenta and within the placenta, there is the fetus. So here, this is the head of the fetus. So basically the fetus here is belly up. So we have here the head and then we have the front legs and this is the abdomen. I, I have to do a couple more better videos to be able to show in this kind of presentations. But in this case, what we can do is we can evaluate the quality of the fluid. We can estimate the size of that fetus. We can see the heartbeat to make sure that the fetus is alive. And all of these are things that you are not going to get from the blood sample. And these are some of the comparisons that I wanted to do. Mm. So here are some of the advantages. Um, differing from the blood sample, you can take decisions right there in that moment. You can decide, okay, I'm gonna send her to market this afternoon, uh, which with the blood sample, you will have to wait for the results. The other thing is that um, with the ultrasound, you can see the viability of that pregnancy. So I can, in the ultrasound, say this look healthy, this heartbeat is normal, the fluid looks clear, um, and in other cases, I will be able to say, okay, yes, it was alive, but it seems like it has died now and she's going to lose the pregnancy. So that's another advantage. The other thing that we can do is that we can kind of like stage pregnancies. So if, for example, you had a long breeding season, you had three months of breeding season, um, and then we are pre-checking one month after the end, we are going to have pregnancies that are 30 days, so one month, and we're gonna have pregnancies that are gonna be already four months at that point. So during the ultrasound, I will be able to tell you, okay, this animal is about 30 days, this animal is about 60, this animal is about 90. And with that, you will be also able to make decisions. Some of the decisions that you can, that you can make once you know when they got pregnant is you could potentially, if you are working with dairy goats, decide, okay, when I'm going to dry, you know, if it's an animal that is in milk, we want to dry them 60 days before um, 
part duration. So at that point, you can estimate when those two months are going to happen. You can separate the animals because we can also do fetal count. Um, so I can, if we do early prep checks, I can tell you, look, it seems like she has twins. It seems like she has triplets. And in that case, you will be able to separate the animals so that you can feed them accordingly. Because one that is pregnant with triplets is going to have more um, nutritional needs than one that is pregnant with a single. So at that point, you could separate them and feed them differently. Um, and that's one of the advantages of, of the fetal count, which is also something that you cannot with the blood test. And if, um, as I was mentioning before, you can also identify pathologies. So one pathology could be, okay, she has a uterine infection, the fetus died, and now there is an infection, and this is how we can treat it. Or another pathology that I could find in ultrasound is those animals that have like pseudo pregnancy. Um, so for example, in that case, we will see just fluid inside the uterus, but not fetus. And then at that point, we could also treat that animal. Um, and then at that point, you can decide where this animal is living, or I'm going to try to get her pregnant again because she's very valuable for me and I still have one month ahead. So I'm gonna put her back with the back. Um, fetal sexing is also something that we can do, but that's something that is not that relevant um, for small ruminant producers because it's not as important as it could be in cattle, but it's something that can be done with the ultrasound. So once you have done that, you're going to be closer to know when your lambing and kidding is going to happen. But let's say that you didn't have the opportunity or the money or the intention or the interest on doing either the blood sample or the ultrasound. You still need to plan ahead when your lambing or kidding season is going to start. So the way to do that is to look back into what was your breeding season. So I have an example here for you. So we are going to say that my breeding season was from July 1st to September 1st. So <clears throat> I did two months of breeding season. And now I need to calculate when is going to be my lambing or my kidding season. So one thing that I recommend is that you can go to Google and literally just type lambing calculator or kidding calculator, and you're gonna find serial pages that have a calculator. We know that it's 145 to 155 days, but if you wanna bother yourself calculating when the 155 days are, you're welcome to do it, but you also have the possibility of, of doing it this way. So what you would do is you just Google it. This is an example that I found. Um, are you seeing the web page? Okay. So this is just an example that I found. So here is my example saying, okay, I put the animals on July 1st of 2021 with the bag or the ram. So this is the earliest that an animal could have got pregnant is the day that I put them together. And this is going to tell you when it's expected to lamb, what is the earliest possible and the latest possible. So the earliest possible for an animal that was bred on July 1st is to be lambing on November 20th. And now I'm going to do the other way around. I'm going to look at the end of my breeding season. So I go to September 1st, that's the last day that the buck or the ram could have mounted one of my females. So if I put that date, now I'm going to look at what is the latest possible lambing or kidding day. And it's telling me January 31st of 2022. So I go back here and now I know that my lambing or kidding season is gonna go from November 20th to January 31st. Unless we have a very premature animal, there is no likelihood that we are gonna have any animal lambing before this. It's probably gonna be an abortion, an abortion rather than an, a lambing. So now you know that from November 20th to January 31st, you don't have vacation, or you're gonna have to have somebody that is going to be there checking that the animals are doing okay during the lambing and the kidding period. So this is very, very important. The other thing that is important from this date is that as we talked yesterday, we have to prepare in advance. 
So now that we know that my early lambing is November 20th, I have to start several months ahead preparing myself for lambing and for kitty. And now we're gonna talk a little bit in detail on what are some of those things that we need to do. So the first thing that we have to be caring for is the dam. Obviously we know um, that there are a lot of consequences of what is happening to the dam is happening to the baby. So one of the things that is very critical in a small ruminants, and we are going to mention it uh, a couple of times, is the nutrition during pregnancy. So something that we have to aim is to have animals that are going to maintain their body condition score all through the pregnancy. So we don't want animals to be losing weight and we don't want animals to be gaining weight. And gaining weight, obviously, I'm not referring to the weight related to the actual pregnancy and the actual fluid inside the uterus. I'm talking about the body condition of the animal. So we wanna have the females in a body condition score of 2.5 to three from one to five during the whole pregnancy. That's gonna be our goal. So during the early gestation, it might not be that critical, sorry, because they might not be having as much demand. So maybe you can just continue to have them in pasture, but it has to be you know, with a moderate quality. Um, or you can start supplementing them with some moderate quality hay um, and, and minerals for sure. So a mineral block is something that is important all the way through their life in general. And then as the late pregnancies start coming in, which hopefully we are familiar with when they are starting to reach late pregnancy, we are going to have to increase the nutrients that we are providing. And I am guessing that Dr. T. Walker is going to touch a little bit on, on some of these things. But obviously as those fetuses are growing inside the, the dam, they are going to have much more demands because they are going to be growing they're gonna be growing really, really fast in the last month of the pregnancy. So the dam has to have the resources to be able to provide all of those nutrients to the lamb or to the kid or kids without having to use her own resources. So this is very important. The other thing that she's doing during the last part of her pregnancy is producing colostrum and preparing herself for milk. So there is much more demands that are coming also in that end of the story. So we really have to make sure that we are feeding the animals accordingly. And here comes back what I was mentioning on, if we have the chance and we know how many animals they're pregnant with, this is a good time to try to stratify them and separate them so that I can feed much more those that are pregnant with triplets than those that are pregnant with singles. Because again, if I feed the same, let's say that I start feeding all of them with a lot of food because there are some that might be pregnant with triplets, then maybe we start putting some weight in those that have just singles. And we're gonna see what the consequence of that is. Here, there are some suggestions, but I will leave that to Dr. D. Walker. The idea is that you're going to increase the, the amount of protein. And we discussed yesterday the, the importance of protein versus energy at different points. Um, and just uh, ensure that there is also an adequate intake of selenium in particular I'm mentioning here, but in general, you're going to have a mineral block or, or in general, just a, a ration that is going to have minerals, but that's also very important. So some of the consequences of an inadequate nutrition during pregnancy or that could have happened something, sometimes when the animal reached pregnancy without having a good body condition score or a good status is that we are going to have problems with some of these diseases. So the first one that I am listing here is pregnancy toxemia. Other people call it ketosis. Other people call it twin disease. Um, there is another one that I... I'm forgetting right now, but there are a couple of colloquial names to the disease. Um, but basically what is happening during this, this disease is that there is gonna be low blood glucose because there is not enough energy that she's consuming. And because of that, she's going to start breaking down the fat that she has in her own body to try to get the energy to put it into that baby and put it into that milk. So that fast processing of the fat within the liver of the dam is going to cause these ketone bodies that are toxic. 
So the more ketone bodies this animal has in her blood circulating because she keeps trying to burn her own fat to produce energy for her uh, babies, the more that she's going to be affected with this pregnancy toxemia. So that's why it's called toxemia is because these ketone bodies are toxic. Some of the symptoms that you are going to start seeing is that she starts lagging behind the rest of the flock. Um, sometimes they will show like they are like just dropping, inappetent, they are more lethargic. Um, a lot of times they will go in recumbency and you might try to encourage them to stand and they will you know, have trouble standing. And a lot of people start associating that with, oh, she's late pregnant. So she's just being you know, tired. But it's very important that we really identify these signs because this is a disease that is going to kill your dam and is going to kill your kids or lambs. So it's very important that we pick up very early on that this is going on so that we can treat it. Mm, animals that are more susceptible to having this disease, as we were saying, those that have uh, multiple pregnancies because maybe they are not eating enough. Um, animals that are thin, and that are going to start having to burn more of their fat. Those that are obese, that's why we don't want obese pregnant animals either, because they are going to have a lot of fat that they are going to be circulating through their um, liver. And those animals that might be like maybe chai or not very dominant. And so maybe the other use or the other those are going to try to get to the food faster and this animal will not and will not eat enough. Um, and so these are kind of like the characteristics of the animals that, that will get this kind of disease. Um, another thing that can happen if you are not feeding your animals properly is that you can have um, low blood calcium. So this is what we call milk fever or hypocalcemia. So same thing, there is a lot of calcium that is being requested by the lambs and the kids inside to grow their bones. And there is a lot of calcium that is being um, transported to the udder to produce milk and colostrum. So a lot of times those high demands with a non-good nutrition is gonna cause that this animal has low concentrations of calcium. And so they are going to also go down. Um, it's also something that we have to be able to identify early enough because we can supplement them with calcium. So you have to be really aware of the possible complications during the late pregnancy so that you can try to avoid them, but also if they do happen that you can identify them early enough so that they can be um, kind of like recovered early before that, that there is a point of, of no return. Another complication during the late pregnancy that you can find is the vaginal prolapse. And that's what you see in this picture here. So, some animals, it has been associated with genetics. It's sometimes associated with like multiple pregnancies, but some animals before the actual time of lambing uh, or kidding are going to start prolapsing the vagina. Um, you could initially try to just put it back in place and see if that's enough, but a lot of times those animals will continue to prolapse the vagina. So there are a couple of things that you can do. There is something that is called the use saver that is basically, um, like a harness, but that goes inside the vagina. So it pushes the vagina in, and then it has like sides that will go on the side of the, of the legs of the U, and then you can tie it to keep the vagina in. Or there are sutures that your veterinarian can place in the vagina so that the, so that the vagina doesn't protrude, in the vulva so the vagina doesn't protrude. And then last and least desire also, we have um, several uh, different, viruses and parasites and uh, bacteria that can cause abortion. So sometimes an abortion can happen. So it's normal to have up to 4% or 3% of abortions in your herd. And sometimes that's normal. Some of these abortions are not even due to an infectious disease. It could be just that the animal fell down. It could be that the fetus was abnormal and it could not survive for longer. There are a lot of different causes that are not infectious. But since we don't know, as soon as you have an abortion, there are a couple of recommendations. 
One is to isolate that animal, separate it from the rest of the herd in case there is an infectious disease, she's not gonna be able to transmit it to the other pregnant animals. That's something that is important. Clean the area, so if she aborted, let's say in a pen, don't use that pen until you have disinfected that pen. Same thing to prevent that you're transmitting the disease to other species, to other animals. And then another recommendation is that you call your veterinarian or your state lab and find out what samples can you submit for them to diagnose what was the cause of abortion. In that case, we will be able potentially to stop an abortion storm. So if we find out what it was and we find out it's an infectious disease, maybe we can treat the other pregnant animals before they start aborting. So that's the recommendation there. Um, and the last thing that I want to, to point out in terms of the caring of your pregnant females is um, in terms of parasite control. So we wanna make sure that they are not, you know, with a very high burden of parasites. So we will use some of the things that were discussed in, in the first day of the conference. So we could do the FAMACHA, we could do fecal account. And if we find out that this animal needs to be dewormed, then the recommendation is to deworm it even during pregnancy. But the important part here is that you make sure that the label of that dewormer is okay for pregnant animals. That's very important. There are a couple of dewormers that can cause fetal abnormalities or even abortion. So it's very important that you read and that you make sure that it's safe for pregnant animals. And then at that point, you can deworm your females. Vaccination is something that varies depending on the producers. Some producers use vaccine for several diseases. Some producers just use the minimum. Uh, what we consider the minimum or the core vaccine will be the CDNT, so Clostridium perfringens CD and tetanus vaccine. And that one you can also give during pregnancy. And with that, you are also providing the baby with some immunity for these diseases so that when he's born, he already has some. And in addition, the you or the doe will be putting some antibodies in her milk. So the babies will have some antibodies when they are consuming milk. Um, in terms of the other, if you are talking about dairy goats, then it's important, as we mentioned before, that 60 days before, um, kidding, she gets dry so that you stop milking them. And then the other important thing, regardless of sheep, goat, for milk or for meat, is that you monitor the other. So you're going to see if they are having some edema at the beginning of the pregnancy, if they get mastitis. Sometimes they can get mastitis even if they are not nursing. Um, and that overall that you're having a good development of that um, other so that she's going to uh, be able to feed their baby. Okay, so moving along, we are getting closer to our lambing and our kidding. So we are going to have to decide at this point where we are going to lamb or kid. So that's also not right answer. There is no right and wrong. It depends on your production system. It depends on what you are comfortable with. It depends on um, the conditions that you have, the facilities that you have. Uh, so you can decide yourself depending on your situation, but it could be indoor or outdoor. Um, the important thing is that it's in a clean and dry area. So if you're doing it outdoor, clean and dry means just make sure that it's not, you know, in a pasture that is like muddy and that, you know, you put your feet in and you're 10 centimeters in your boot. So that's kind of like the thing that you want to prevent, that they are going to be uh, born in these like muddy conditions. Other than that, pasture is okay for, for lambing or kidding. The important thing is that you keep an eye on your animals, you're checking them daily so that you uh, can identify any problem and act accordingly. The other thing that is important and not something that is extremely critical in Florida, but it's important still because as we have said, most of the kidding and lambing occurs in the winter. So if you're gonna have temperatures that are going to be basically reaching the 30, 32, then maybe you wanna make sure that your animals are not getting hypothermic and they are not like getting too cold that they are not standing to nurse. And so just keep an eye on the temperatures for those extreme low temperatures in, in Florida. Um, other than that, outside, 
uh, lambin or kidney is okay. The other thing that I have here is a list and you have it in your presentation. Um, this is kind of like the minimum basic list of things that you have to have. So what I recommend is have it in advance, put them in a bucket, have them all ready because if your lambing starts at two in the morning, that's not when you wanna be looking for your flashlight. So you wanna have everything set up, everything ready, print your checklist, a few weeks before, make sure that you have everything, put it in a bucket and have it ready so that you can take it with you to the pasture or to the barn whenever it's needed. Basic things that we put here is um, a record. So it's important that you keep good records so that you know who is the mother, how many she had, what day they were born, were there females or were there males. So I have there a picture of um, just an example of the one that we, that we use here at the university. We assign the number to the lamb. Um, and eventually you can use these forms later on to continue reporting other things on these animals. So we put the day that we tail dog them um, and so forth, so on. Um, for the processing of the lambs, we, which we will we'll talk about later on, it's also important that you have already the ear tags. So don't wait until lambing to start to go and buy ear tags, have them ready have the thing that you're gonna use to tag them. And if you're not gonna ear tag them, you also will have then something like a chalk or like animal paint to make sure that you know who is born to who, because that's what is going to allow you to, if you find a lamb that is without a mother, that you're going to find the right mother for the right lamb. And so those are like some of the big important recommendations at the beginning. Um, we will talk about it in more detail when we will use each of these different things. Um, just the recommendation is go through the list, look at it, adjust it to your own production and make sure that you have everything ready. One thing that I want to highlight here now is have your veterinarian's phone number. You don't wanna be at three in the morning with lube in your hand and blood in the other one with the lamb stack trying to find where the phone number of your veterinarian is because there is an issue and this animal needs to be seen. So have it on hand, have a relationship with a veterinarian. You don't need to be you know, calling it daily. You don't need to be having them come in daily, but you need to establish a relationship with a veterinarian so that the day that you call at 3 a.m., that person is going to pick up the phone. Otherwise, a lot of veterinarians will not see patients or will not see animals that are not from uh, patients or owners that they have worked with. So that's one recommendation that I have to stretch there. Okay, so let's start now getting into business. So we are getting closer and closer into like parturition time. So we are going to make sure that we are looking at the development of the other, making sure that um, these animals are you know, filling up their udder. They're going to start relaxing the muscles in the pelvis because they are starting to open their birth canal. Sometimes you would see that there is some milk already coming from their teeth. And then sometimes you can see the cervical plug. So it's that mucus that is going to start coming from their vagina that was sealing uh, everything closed. So sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. We are going to talk about normal parturition here. So the first stage on normal parturition is the contractions. This stage lasts from two to 12 hours. In this case, the animal is going to isolate, it's gonna separate from the other ones, it's going to start nesting, um, it's going to be very restless, it's gonna lay down, it's gonna stand up, walk a little bit, go down. Sometimes they urinate very frequently. And that's one sign that she's starting the process of parturition. I have here just a quick video. But she's nesting, she's going down. They are a lot of times vocalizing as well. Sometimes you can see in their abdomen that they're having some contractions and that's already indicating you that the parturition is imminent. So that's first stage. The second stage of parturition is the actual delivery of the baby. So this one should last one to two hours. So once you see the bag showing up in the vagina, there should be at the most one hour from that moment until you see the baby in the ground. 
a lot of use and those will lay down in lateral recumbency and they're gonna give birth in lateral recumbency. Some other animals actually uh, do it, mostly the ones that are more experienced will do it standing. So you see the placenta already coming out. Sometimes you see the feet and you're going to give it an hour for her to, to start pushing that baby up. Up. So you start seeing already parts of the baby coming out. So this is progressing well. I'll give her some time to do it by herself. And if at some point I see that things are not progressing well enough, then I will intervene. In some other occasions, you don't see the back. Sometimes the back can rupture before and you are gonna start seeing uh, just parts of the fetus or the baby itself. This is my favorite picture ever. So what is a normal parturition? A normal parturition in a chip or a goat is that one of an animal that is presented either anterior, so the front legs, or posterior, the back legs. So these two positions are normal positions for parturition. The important thing though, is that the back or like the spine of the lamb or the kid is parallel or is facing also the top so that you have both the spine of the lamb and spine of the dam, they are aligned in the top. That's a normal parturition. Another thing that makes it normal is that you have extended uh, structure. So if she's coming with the face front, you have to have the two legs extended and the neck and head extended. And if it's coming backwards, you need to have both legs extended. This is considered normal parturition. Anything outside this is abnormal. We will get to there. Now I just wanted to close up the window by saying there is a third stage of parturition that is the passing of the placenta. And this one has to occur in the first six to 12 hours. Most of them will do it in the first six hours, but we consider that the placenta was retained or the afterbirth was retained if they haven't passed it after 24 hours. And this is important because this makes them prone to infection and we might have to put them on antibiotics before they have a, any further issue. After that, you are gonna see some lochia, which is basically the discharge from where they are cleaning from parturition. So you will see some red brown discharge for a couple of weeks that comes from the vagina. And as long as it doesn't smell bad, that's normal. So ideally you're gonna let the animal lamb or kid by itself. But if at some point you see that there is a moment to intervene because there is no progress, then you can do it. And that's what we will call an abnormal parturition of the, or a distortion. So the important thing here is that you keep in mind cleanness, lubrication, and gentleness. Those are kind of like these three rules to intervene in a parturition. So we are gonna see one of the possible causes of dystocia. So one of them is ringworm or failure to dilate the cervix. So where you see here in the arrow is, you know, she's ready to give birth. She maybe start doing contractions, but the babies are not coming out. So at that point you start suspecting that she's not dilating her cervix and that's why the babies are not coming out. There are different causes why this could happen. Sometimes it's nutritional if they didn't have enough strength to, to do it. Sometimes if the animal is coming in the wrong position, it will not create that effect of dilation. So that's also something to consider. And sometimes it's also just an inheritable problem and that animal potentially should not stay in the herd. Regardless of what was the cause, you're going to try to intervene. So you stayed it for a while, seeing here that she was ready to give birth and then she never progressed. So at that point, you can put your, your sleep. Um, you can use a lot of lube. That's super important that you use a lot of lube, that you clean the area, and that you go slightly and gently through the vagina to see what's going on. So the recommendation is that you put your hand kind of like in a cone shape, a lot of lube, and then you go vaginally. At that point, you're going to find either the membranes, fetus, or a closed cervix. So basically you're gonna find your hand like reaching this point where it cannot advance more. And that will be an animal that is having this, 
this um, syndrome that is the ringworm. So what you could try to do for a little bit is try to dilate with your fingers. Maybe you can put one finger in, maybe a little bit later you can put two, maybe three, and hopefully you're going to be able to dilate it and help with the baby. But a lot of times these animals will not dilate. And at that point, if you have not made any progress over the next 10 to 15 minutes, it will be important to call the veterinarian. Let's say that she was progressing and eventually you saw membranes and you are waiting now for the baby and nothing happened. So we have the 30-30-30 rule. So the 30-30-30 rule is wait for 30 minutes after she start straining and you saw the bag. And if she hasn't pushed the baby out, then go and check. Same thing, go check with your hand, see if things are normal. If you find that everything is normal, then back up, give her other 30 minutes and go again. So that's the 30, 30. The other 30 is added when you are looking into whether you're having more lambs or more kids. So after she has lambed or kitted one baby, you give her 30 minutes for the next one to come before you start uh, putting pressure on her. What are some causes of um, dystocia? One of them is malposition. So malposition will be an animal that is coming with flexed legs or that is coming like belly up. So those all variations of the, up, of the normal position. So all of these three images that you have here are abnormal positions. If you have one leg flex, two leg flex, or the head or the neck flex, then that animal is going to have very, very, very hard time trying to come out. And here, what you can try to do is you can try to go in and reposition that animal in a way that it can go back to a normal position where it will come out more naturally. The recommendation is, again, lots of lube, go in. Sometimes it's important that you push him or her back a little bit to where you have more space. So if we go into this picture, if I try to here get this neck, maybe I won't reach, but if I push it back a little bit, here I have a little bit more of a space to work that animal. So I go gently in, try to grab that head, put it straight, and once I have it in the normal position, then I will be pulling that animal out. So you can just grab the legs with your, with your hand, put one in each of these spaces, and you can help the animal to, push, to, to come out. I have a picture here. So if you try for five minutes to straight that leg or that head and there was no progress, then the recommendation is to call your veterinarian because the longer you're waiting here, the more that you're putting in risk the life of that baby. So here's an example of how a veterinarian is intervening. So she went in, and then now she's grabbing the legs and just pulling gently with the contraction of the, of the goat. And now this baby is out. The important thing is, again, be clean, using lots of lube, and just being gentle. Another cause of dystocia could be if you have two babies at the same time, so you have three legs. When you go by hand, you go in and you realize that there are three legs or four legs, and that's why they are not coming out. So once again, you can gently try to manipulate it so that you push one of the babies out like or push one of the babies in so that you have access to the one that is closer to come out. And that will be something that you could do. Another thing that happens sometimes is that the fetus is abnormal. So if we have a malformed fetus, let's say big head or you know six legs, which happens, um, then this animal is going to have more trouble uh, coming out. So you, again, will try to do it. Another thing that will happen is that maybe it's too big, maybe it's overdue, or maybe the back or ram that you use was too big for this dough and potentially the baby is too big, then you can give it a quick try. And if things don't progress, just call your veterinarian. In particular, in these cases, when there is a baby that is too big, the only solution is to go to C-section. So it's important that it's done faster. So regardless of whether they had the baby in their own or if you had to assist, there are a couple of recommendations of what to do right after. So if you have some clean towels or like even um, 
newspaper, you can use that to basically um, do a little bit of rubbing in the thorax so that they start breathing, cleaning their nostrils, cleaning their mouth so that they are you know, able to breathe well, and then just presented it to the dog or to the you so that they start creating their bonding. At that point, leave them alone, give them a space. Bonding is very, very important, so just give them a space. Give her 30 minutes to see if she's giving birth to another baby, and if you don't see anything coming out, then you can approach her, either try vaginally or in the abdomen to see if there is any other baby that is, needs help to come out. Other than that, leave her alone, let her clean her baby, and now just observe and make sure that this baby drinks milk in the first six hours of birth. And that's something else that I am stretching here a little bit. So um, calostrum is very, very, very important for the lambs. If they don't consume calostrum in the first six hours, what they have in their um, intestines that allow them to absorb like all the antibodies is going to close. It's going to shut down and they're not going to be able to absorb it after. And they're gonna be prone to get infections and a lot of diseases. So it's very important that they consume colostrum. So one of the things that you can do is you can strip the teeth for the first time. because Sometimes it has like a plug that does not allow the baby to nurse. So you can strip to make sure that there is milk coming out and then letting them try to do it in their own. If they are not doing it in their own, the recommendation is that you get it close and you put it to the mother to see if you can encourage the baby to consume milk. If by any reason that doesn't help, then you are going to have to either milk the dough or the you, or have frozen colostrum that you can thaw to feed the baby. Again, important that you feed it in the first hours of life. So either you milk the dough or you have colostrum and then you can use a bottle to try to feed it. And if this baby is too weak and for some reason doesn't want to drink from the bottle, then you're gonna have to tube the baby. Um, finally, just remember to dip the navel more for those animals that are born outside or that are inside and then you have too many, then you wanna like disinfect their um, umbilicus. Uh, you wanna check that they don't have any congenital defect we're gonna put the ear tag or the number as we mentioned before, so that you are able to identify them and correlate them with what their mother is. Um, it's always good to weigh them because it's a way to keep records of your, of your progression in the farm. Um, so what are your birth weights and how can you improve them? And then if you think that you are in an area that has selenium deficiency, this is a good time also to give the babies some selenium supplementation. Keep an eye on them. You want to make sure they're bond. You want to make sure the babies are nursing. And you want to make sure that the dough doesn't have any problems afterwards. So here is just a list of some of the possible complications after parturition that you want to keep an eye on. So summarizing, as we said yesterday, just be prepared, organize yourself in advance, have everything that you're going to need. I repeat it like four times, I'm gonna repeat it five. Be clean, be gentle, call for help if you need it. Um, and then just follow for their progression to see how they are doing. Um, I think that's about it. If you guys have any question, I'll be happy to answer it. And same as yesterday, if there is something that you wanna ask later on, here is my email so you can message me. Catalina, um, Joan had a question, is prolapse hereditary? That's a good question. Um, vaginal prolapse is. Um, uterine prolapse is not. Uterine prolapse is most of the times associated with some event that was happening in that particular pregnancy. But vaginal prolapse has been found to be inheritable. So it's possible that this same female is going to prolapse in the next parturition, and it's possible that she's going to transmit to her offsprings that, um, let's say, defect. So it is something that you can select for. So I would either 
keep her and see how she does next year or I could potentially decide that I will not keep her for the next um, lambing or kidding season. And then maybe that's a selection criteria for her offsprings. Maybe I should not keep any of the doubters of that animal just to prevent to have that problem later on. Okay, we got Luis with a question. Go ahead, Luis. Yeah, hi. Uh, in terms of dystocia, um, once I got my female that have some dystocia uh, parturition, if she's tend to repeat the dystocia for next year, or that's something that's just gonna happen once? Um, no, most of the times it's an isolated event. Like it depends what it was, right? So if it was basically that she had, you know, the baby had like a flexed leg, that might not happen next time. Or it might, but just bad luck. So if that's the cause of the dystocia, I wouldn't worry. Um, if the cause of the dystocia was, for instance, a uh, malformed fetus. So a malformed fetus could be also something isolated. Maybe she ate something that caused the malformation. Or sometimes it's an inheritable problem. But it's something that you don't know for sure. So I would not basically judge an animal for a malformed fetus unless it happens twice. Um, what other one? You know, another cause of dystocia is that the animal is too big. That usually was the fault of the ram or the fault of the back. So what I would do next year is I would make sure that I use an animal that has a smaller frame so that I prevent that I have that issue. So no, I I, I would not select them for, for dystocia, basically, to answer your question short. Okay, thank you. Any other additional questions for Catalina? Go ahead, Hayden. Well, I have a question. I have a question. Um, so I've heard that symptoms of hypocalcemia and ketosis can be pretty similar. So how would you go about determining uh, which one would be affecting your you and like what 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 are your kind of first steps uh, as in treatment for whichever one? That's a good question. So. Um, one quick way to do it will be to measure glucose. So you can make measure glucose in just like the same human glucosimeter um, and see if the glucose is very low. And they also sell sticks. Um, I don't know what else is called. It's called sticks. So they basically have sticks that you can measure ketones in. Let me stop the sharing so that I can, there you go. So basically they are just little sticks that you can, depending on which ones you buy, that you can put in urine, in blood, or in milk. And depending on the color that it changes to, it will tell you if there are ketones. So if you find ketones in blood, urine, or um, milk, it means that she's having ketosis or pregnancy toxemia. So that, that's an, an easy way to find out and non-expensive way to have it. So it will be something that that we should include, I guess, in our kit of things to have. Um, in terms of like the, the the treatment, if you are suspecting one or the other one, you can um, give them something sweet. So you can give them propylene glycol. That's also usually something that they will not want to eat in their own. So you will have to like give it with a syringe. Um, or you could like give them molasses uh, to give them like a, a good source of, of of energy. You could also give them um, basically IV uh, glucose. And for the case of calcium, you could also give them IV calcium or subcutaneous calcium if you're suspecting that that's what the problem is. Um, I, I would start with those two, just trying to provide them like some calcium and some sort of like sugar and then see if they respond to it. If you start seeing that there is not a good response, um, then I will call the veterinarian or try the approach that we didn't. Thank Catalina, you. Catalina, Catalina, yes. if they're gonna give calcium, don't they need to be very, very careful about how much and how fast they give that calcium though. Yes. So usually, awesome. <laughs> usually most of the producers will give it subcutaneous. And so when you give it subcutaneous, that calcium is going to be absorbed slowly. 
And as the calcium is absorbed slowly, then there is less risk. If you were to try to give it IV, then yes, you have to be very, very cautious. You have to do it very slow. A lot of times if we do it, we are doing it while we are also listening to their heart to make sure that there is not a, like an increase of heart rate because the calcium is going to affect also the, the heart. So that's that's where that um, comment is, is coming from. And it's a, it's a very, very important comment for sure. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Cabrera? I do have a question about Bioprin. Yes. Um, so I did some, I put a ram with some used this spring and just thought I'd try it for some oxys and lambs, but um, all of mine came back open. But what was weird is that I had one that was questionable, but all of my used that are about 10 years old all had a significantly higher Bioprin than the young used. Is that normal or is that... Mm. how does the bioprint work so i think all of my young use that are like four and under had like point oh point oh eight it would have been point oh eight ish but all my um older females i have three of them and they were both they were all point one i think one three one two um so i just wondered if that had to do with age or is that just just weird that's, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. The truth is that I don't use Bioprint. <laughs> okay. Well, cause the one the one that was questionable, she was only actually with the RAM for one day. So I'm pretty sure that she didn't take. So I was just curious if that was age related or. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not familiar it's... enough to be able to differentiate okay. it, but it, I think it would make sense that, that they will have like higher uh, concentrations of it. When they're but... older? Yeah, but this okay. I, I am not familiar. Actually, okay. I, I see it, it also depends on how long after parturation. Oh, so yeah, one of them had only had, she had her lamb like maybe two months before that. Bingo. That's what it was. She was still carrying leftover. Yeah, yeah. so sometimes okay. that, and that's why it's recommended that you don't use it ever as a diagnostic when it's less than 30 days to 45 days from the previous parturition because okay. it still give you a false negative. Okay, awesome. Um, a Thank false you. positive. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but also I see that Luis is here and she uses this. I don't know if you have seen the same Luis on your animals in terms of like having differences by age. Um, not not really in differences in age, but yes, um, definitely we make 100% sure to see when the youth have lost, you know, had their lambs, because obviously for at least 75 days after that, you can't use Bioprint, it gives you false readings, and it is exactly 75 days. Okay. Um, the youth will come back showing that they're still pregnant, having that pregnancy protein in it. But after that, then obviously the first 30 days, there is still like that 5% chance that I open you will read that she's actually pregnant when she's not. So you have to go, you know, on 60 days and then test again. So it's a question of like, you know, it's a test that you need to consecutively keep on doing to make sure that you get, you know, the correct readings and stuff. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't know it was a specifically 75 days. That's an interesting value because in, in cattle is less than that. So I guess that it, it in small ruminants, it carry on for longer. Even in cattle, it's 70 days. Hmm. <coughs> yes, I tested uh, that um, by mistake. <laughs> Yes, our, our cattle is definitely also 70 days. That's what we have found with them as, as well. So we just work with both cattle and them on 75 days to make sure that we sort of, you know, get the thing. Obviously in the cattle, it's a bit easier because I can ultrasound them getting the results quicker. Um, unfortunately, I can't ultrasound my sheep yet. So otherwise I would have done that versus Biobrin for sure. All right, any other questions? All right, so Dr. Cabrera has committed herself to making a good extension publication for this topic, right? Oh, yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> Thank you. This is this okay. is very important. This is really good information, and uh, uh, you know we just appreciate your willingness to to be here twice, um, and uh, continue to work with us. Uh, and, you know, just uh, you know, thanks thanks for that. Okay, next topic is going to be uh, held by Dr. Elias, and I'm going to ask him to uh, go ahead and share his screen and fire away. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Perfect. Okay. So we got captions for the uh, ones that that got a choppy connection, so we, we're, we're covered. Okay, I hope you can all see the full screen mode of my presentation. Yes. So again, before I start my presentation, thank you very much for the invite. I really appreciate that. It's, it's always a pleasure talking about nutrition. Um, so this uh, talk is more focused on, on the breeding block, but this is just an overview of what we'll be covering today. Um, we'll be going through some of the fundamentals of nutrition and um, a lot of, uh, I mean, most of us are aware of these fundamentals, so maybe for most of us it will be reviewed. Uh, but I think this is very important just to set up uh, a base so that we can build on that when we talk about the nutrient requirements uh, for the feeding plot. And then we'll move on to the pre-breeding nutrition and the reproductive outcome in, in use. Um, I'll have a quick example of a diet formulation, um, like how we can use the quality uh, estimates of forages, of grains, and how we can use that to formulate a well-balanced diet. And then lastly, some of the remarks uh, from the presentation. So whenever we, uh, we put together a presentation, the first thing that comes to my mind is why am I doing this presentation? And we all know that nutrition, nutrition is important, right? I mean, uh, we always talk about nutrition. Nutrition is so much related with all the physiological stages uh, of sheep and goat. Um, but one thing which is very important for, for our producers is the economic sustainability. And feed accounts for the majority of the cost of raising sheep and goats. Now, I have seen that range from 50 to 80% of total cost, depending on how efficient we are in managing feed and how efficient we are in formulating our diets. Are we wasting feed? Are we wasting dollars on that? So again, a good part of nutrition, a more effective nutrition, saves a lot of feed cost. Nutrition is a foundation of good health, um, and we have discussed a lot about reproductive health in the last couple of days. And nutrition is a key aspect in all of these parameters that we have discussed. Animals on high plane of nutrition are always more resistant to diseases. Um, and nutritional problems are second only to respiratory problems uh, and the frequency of occurrence. So that, that shows how important it is to learn about nutrition. And last but not the least, it has a huge impact on the reproduction. So we are dealing with ruminants and they are miracles. And all this miracle that is done is mainly because of this multi-chambered stoma. So the feed goes from the esophagus uh, to the rumen and the reticulum where the feed is fermented with the help of microbes and then later on, the feed passes through omasum, abomasum, and then the small intestine. So most of the forages that we are feeding to these animals are degraded in the rumen using microbes. Okay? And if I just take the section of the rumen and I look how it looks from inside, it is a towel-shaped appearance. We, all, we see all of these small papillae that you can see on the inside of the rumen. These papillae harbors rumen bugs, that includes bacteria, protozoa, um, archaea, and also these papillae help with the absorption of all the end products that, that the feed degradation is generating. If there's any problem with this papillae, there's a problem with absorption, there's a problem with uh, nutrient utilization. So we have to make sure that the animals are developing well right from the birth so that the rumen is well developed at the stage when they are starting to consume forages. Now, all of these feed degradation, whether it's forages, whether grains, is happening in the rumen and the reticulum, rumen being the larger chamber. Now, this feed is digested by these rumen microbes, mainly bacteria, 
and the protozoa. They create a lot of gases that includes methane and there's a huge human cry about all the methane emissions that, that is being generated from ruminants, which is entirely not corrected. Totally different lecture on that. But again, um, it generates gases as a part of fermentation. But during this process, these microbes, uh, they degrade forages, they degrade grains, and then they provide nutrients to, uh, to ruminants. Now, this is an example of the number of these bugs that are present in the room. I can't even uh, say it's like 100 billion bacteria, okay? This is an example of cow, but sheep and goat are not different. So the point of this slide is that when we are feeding these animals, we are actually feeding rumen bugs. We're actually feeding rumen microbes, rumen bacteria, rumen protozoa. They use the feed that we're providing. If they are in good health, the feed is fermented well, the feed is degraded well. If the microbes are in poor health, the animals suffer because of lack of nutrient utilization. So this concept is very important. The feed is for microbes. We want to make sure that the rumen is healthy. We want to make sure that the microbes are healthy. And then in turn, the animal will stay healthy with the help of this nutrition. Now, with this basic concept of how the feed is utilized in the rumen, let's switch over here to the nutrients that are more important for these animals. Now, the very first nutrient that we keep talking about is total digestible nutrients or TDN, okay? So TDN is, is a proxy of a digestible energy in ruminants. Now, what is digestible energy? The energy that is available to the animals, excluding energy that is lost in the feces. So this is the animal, uh, this, is, this is the digestible energy and total digestible nutrients or TDN is, a, is just gives you how much of energy animals require um, if um, we have these requirements. It is expressed in kilograms, pounds, or percent, depending on how we are using that. And again, the last point is how we estimate it. The reason why we are still sticking to TDN as a proxy for energy is because it is very easy to use. We just analyze our feed, any forage that we are feeding, any concentrates or grains that we are feeding, and we uh, estimate the value of crude protein, crude fat, fiber, and soluble components. We just estimate these components. We estimate how much of digestibility associated with these components. We sum it all up and it gives us a value of a total digestible nutrients. We'll give an example of some of the forages and their TDN content. The higher the TDN content, the more energy that feed can provide. The lower the TDN content, the less energy that feed can provide. Forages, if we talk about warm season grasses, they have the TDN in the range of 40 to 50 to 60%. If we talk about grains, corn grain, it has a TDN of about 90%. So it is a very high quality feed because the TDN is very high, the energy availability is very high. Forages, yeah, we have to make sure how we use these forages because we do not have a lot of energy coming out from these forages. Now I'll spend a little more time on the crude protein as well, because most of our feed formulation revolves around total digestible nutrients in the crude protein. We say this is a crude protein because it is a very crude estimate of protein. Now, when I say crude estimate, why do I say crude? Because we are not measuring protein. We are not measuring crude protein. Let's take an example of a Bermuda grass here. The protein content, the crude protein is around 10%. Now, this is not the true protein. This is not the amino acid that is present in this grass. This is the total, any component that can provide nitrogen. That is, uh, that, that will be used for the protein estimation. The nitrogen can come from true protein. The nitrogen com can come from other sources that contains nitrogen, but they are not protein. For example, urea. For example, nucleotides, for example, nucleotide bases, these all can, like, contain neon nitrogen and they can synthesize protein in the rumen. So that's why we include that component as protein. But this is a very crude estimate. And then this crude protein has two components. The first component that is broken down in the rumen that is called as the rumen 
degradable protein. As the name indicates, it is degraded in the rumen. And then the second part, which bypasses rumen, which is not degraded in the rumen, which is called as rumen undegraded protein. Now, when we are just doing a basic diet formulation, we are balancing for TDN, we are balancing for crude protein, we don't balance for RDPs and RDPs. But when we are formulating a diet for a very high producing animal, then we have to make sure that we provide good amount of RDP and a good amount of RUP. Okay. So this is just to give you a concept on what is crude protein and the classification of RDPs and RUPs. Now, having said that, there are other nutrients which are also very, very important when we are formulating diets. These are minerals, vitamins, and last but not the least, water. We all know how, wa how much water is important, so I'll not uh, elaborate on that, but about minerals, I think this is a huge uh, part of diet formulation, and we still have a lot of knowledge needs to be gained for small ruminants. The information that we have so far have was, was developed 30, 40 years back, and we do not have a very precise requirement for minerals, for macro as well as micro minerals, because this is a very difficult uh, uh, phase, very difficult area of study. How we are providing minerals? We are providing minerals as a premix. We are getting a concentrate uh, uh, supplement from, from, the, uh, from the commercial uh, enterprises, and then we are mixing that in the diet. I'll not discuss more about minerals uh, in this lecture, but just want to elaborate that this is also a very important component of diet formulation. Vitamins, um, again, the vitamins are provided in the diet to make sure that there are no deficiencies. And then we need to make sure that animals are providing provided ad libitum water to make sure they can utilize these nutrients. Now, this is the slide that I borrowed uh, from Kathleen. Um, she presented a um, couple of days back, and I thought this is a very important slide just to give you an overview of different quality of the grasses that we are feeding to our animals. These are the warm season grasses. These are warm season perennials, warm season annuals. And you can see that there's a big range. Let's take an example of a Bermuda grass here. The crude protein content is nine to 11% and the TDN is 50 to 58%. Now, even this, this is a range here, 50 to 58%. And the range comes from the time of the harvest of these grasses. If we're harvesting it sooner, maybe it has more energy available. Harvesting it later, it is more fiber. It is more undigestible fiber. It can lower your TDN values. If the grasses are more mature, it can lower our TDN values. But even if you look at between these species, there is a difference. For example, sunham. It has a very good TDN value, ranging from 65 to 71%, better than Bermuda grass. Now, why are these values important? These values are important because whenever we look at the inventory of our farm, we need to look at the resources. We need to look at what kind of grasses we have at the farm so that we can formulate a diet based on the available resources. So these values will be important uh, when we formulate our diets. And I will give an example at the last of the presentation on how we can use these values to formulate a nutrient adequate diet. So before I go into the breeding nutrition, I would like to discuss one more concept. That is the nutrient density. Let's say for an example that the requirement for an animal is 10 pounds of TDN, 10 pounds of total digestible nutrients. Now, this is required for any physiological state. I have different feeds present with me. I have straw. To provide 10 pounds of TDN, I need to feed 25 pounds of straw to make sure that I provide enough energy for that animal. If I have alfalfa, I need to provide 18 pounds of alfalfa to provide 10 pounds of TDN. But if I use corn, as I mentioned earlier, it has a very high TDN value. Only 11 pounds of corn are enough to provide 10 pounds of feed. Now, why this concept is important? Can I feed straw, completely straw, like 25 pounds of straw to provide 10 pounds of TDN? Yes, I can feed it. 
it's, it's my decision. If I want to feed it or not, I can feed it. I can offer it to animals, but will, will animals eat it? They will not because they have a limited capacity. They cannot consume 25 pounds of straw, right? So that's why we have to cut down on the straw. Can I provide 18 pounds of alfalfa? I can, but again, animals will not consume 100% of 18, 100% of alfalfa. Can I provide 11 pounds of corn? Yes, I can. And animals may be able to consume it because it is a very nutrient dense ration. But can I feed uh, just corn? I cannot. So the concept here I want to come to is that we are always mixing feeds. And the reason we are mixing feeds is to make sure that we balance the nutrient density of the ration and meet the nutrient requirements. So I can have some amounts of alfalfa, I can have some amounts of straw, I can have some amounts of corn, and I can balance this ration so that this feed animals can consume without, without uh, ex uh, exceeding the physical limit of the rumen, and still I can meet 10 pounds of feeding. So that's why nutrient density is important. The same goes with protein. If the requirement is one pound of protein, I need to feed 25 pounds of straw, 5.5 pounds of alfalfa, and two pounds of soybean meal, right? I do not want to feed two pounds of soybean meal. First of all, it is very expensive and it is a grain. And if I provide 100% of diet of soybean meal, animals may be acidotic because it ferments really fast in the room. And we might be losing a lot of nitrogen because it is not utilized in the room. Right? So again, the concept here is we have to mix different ingredients present in the present of the farm. And again, it is very important to have multiple sources of different nutrients. We cannot rely on just one or two sources. We have to have multiple sources. So just in case we have one source that is a very poor quality feed, we can always uh, fall back on the other sources that are good quality. And we can still manage to uh, formulate a diet that is well balanced. So let's take an example of 150 pounds of you with a twin peak lactation that needs 0.9 pounds of crude protein. Okay, so this is the requirement that is 0.9 pounds. 11 pounds of dry matter that is coming from corn that can provide this much protein. And then I can have uh, this much amount of alfalfa hay, straw, and soybean meal. And again, we'll all just mix these diets to prepare a well-balanced diet for our animal that can provide 0.9 pounds of crude protein. Now, where am I getting these requirements? All of these requirements are coming from this book and I, I'll always keep it handy. It's a uh, nutrient requirements for small animals. Um, we don't have to memorize that. It's already available there. So we know how, what are the requirements at different physiological stages. And these requirements vary by species, breed, body weight, age and sex, what stage they are in, what level of production um, they are at, and what kind of environment they are living in. Right? So all of these are factors that can determine, that will determine, or that determines the nutrient requirement of our animal. Now, this is what we have summarized in last couple of days, going through different physiological stages, starting with breeding, gestation, lactation, a stage of weaning, the dry period, and again, going back to breeding and gestation. In this lecture, we are focusing on breeding and the gestation. But the reason I mentioned this whole cycle is because we just cannot discuss uh, these two stages in isolation. What we are doing during the dry period will affect how we feed during breeding. How we feed during breeding will affect how we feed during gestation and lactation, right? So all of these stages are interconnected. These are interrelated. So I think what is very important is that instead of taking one physiological stage and making sure that we do well, we have to think about an entire system and to make sure that during every stage of the system, we are providing diets that are nutritionally balanced for these animals and they do not have any deficiency. So before jumping into some of the breeding requirements, let's look at this graph and why nutrient requirements are changing and why we should be providing different nutrition during breeding. 
So on this, there are a couple of axes. This is the X axis, which shows months ranging from one to 12. This is one year cycle. And on the Y axis, we have body weight changes. So let's start from lambing. From the lambing, as um, use lamb or as goes uh, kidding, the body weight goes down drastically. And we can see there's a sharp decline in the body weight on this graph. Okay. Now, once they uh, once they lamb, once they kid, then the lactation period starts. This is the time when they are using their body reserves to make sure that the milk yield is not compromised. Okay. Now, at this point. Again, even if we provide good nutrition, there is a possibility that they will still lose weight because their lactation is the biggest priority at this stage. Now, they will lose weight until the point of weaning because they are supporting the growth of uh, their offspring. Now, after weaning, the lactation stops and whatever energy that we are providing in the diet is going towards building body reserves now they will start gaining weight. Now, this is the point that is very important. And this is the point that decides how our breeding season will go and how the conception, will, whether it will be successful or not. So here, we need to make sure that we provide adequate nutrition so that animals can breed and conceive well, okay? Once they conceive pregnant, they start gaining weight and again, they lamb and then the cycle continues. So we can see that there are so many changes going on in the body weight. And during these changes, it is very important that we feed them well. During this lactation phase, this is the phase where there are maximum requirement for nutrition. And we need to make sure that we meet those requirements because the animals are losing body condition even if you provide nutrients. And if we do not provide good nutrients, you can imagine how sharp decline the body condition will be. Now, if we do not feed well here, again, the phase after weaning will not be very effective. They will not gain the condition and the breeding and the conception will not be successful. So all of these things are interconnected. These are all interrelated. So the recommendations that I will provide for breeding, I'm assuming that Everything has been taken care of during the prior part of lactation and during the part of dry period. So let's see how these requirements are changing over time. Again, on the X axis, we have these 12 months. And on the Y axis, we have the dry matter intake. And I'll show you at different physiological stage how the dry matter intake changes. So this is the maintenance part. Now, we, the animals are only maintaining their body weight. This is the phase after weaning until they are going to the breeding season. They are still just maintaining the body weight. And the dry matter intake, in this case, it is like three pounds. Okay. Now, this is the part of flushing where we are preparing these animals for breeding. As we can see that the dry matter um, intake increases here because there's more need for nutrients, there's more need for energy, there's more need for uh, intake. So they will increase their intake. It continues for some time. And then once they are pregnant, the intake goes down. This is the part of early gestation. But once they go to the late gestation, and again, the intake increases. Because late gestation, as uh, Dr. Cabrera mentioned earlier, this is the phase where fetus is growing at a very rapid rate. And if there are single or twins, depending on that, the intake will increase. So this lower bar is for one um, uh, offspring, and then the two second bar, the higher one, is for two. So we can see that the intake is increasing here. And again, lactation, as I mentioned earlier, this is the phase where the nutrient requirement are at peak. And then after that, once they lamb, um, it goes back to the maintenance. Now, there is one point which I really want to mention here, which is very important, that in lactation, unlike gestation, there is just one line here. Because here, animals are limited by physical will. They cannot consume more. 
regardless of how many offspring they have in the uterus. They have a physical fill limit here. So we need to make sure that if there are twins, we need to increase the energy density of the diets here because they cannot consume more than this limit. So hopefully this gives you an idea on how the intake varies at different stages of the production cycle, starting from maintenance, breeding, early gestation, late gestation and lactation, and this is the intake requirement. So the improvement in flushing is around 45%. Late gestation is similar around increase by 45%, 95% increase in the intake during lactation, so you can see that there's a huge increase during different physiological stages. And then the same concept applies for the TDN requirement. However, there's a difference here that now we have these two bars for the TDN. For one offspring, there is lower TDN requirement and for two offspring, there is a greater TDN requirement. So the requirement will vary but animals cannot consume based on the requirement. There's a limit to how much animals can consume. So this graph is exactly similar. Most of part is uh, like the intake, but this is about the total digestible nutrients. And again, these are the values. Um, and you can see in the lactation, there's a sharp increase in the energy requirements around 130 to 170%. This again puts uh, these requirements in the numbers. Again, on the x-axis, we have a maintenance, early gestation, late gestation with single offspring, late gestation with twins, lactation with single and lactation with twins. And the y-axis on the left side, this is crude protein. And on this y-axis, we have intake and energy. We can see that the linear increase in the crude protein requirement at different stages. Um, however, if you look at the dry matter intake, that these blue bars, 4.3 is the maximum limit for these animals. They cannot consume more than 4.3 um, pounds a day. Now here, the requirement is still high, but they still consume the same amount of feed. So we need to improve the density of the ration. This is the energy. Again, the energy increases, but the intake does not increase. And this is the requirement at different stages. I would like to focus your attention on these two parts. We can see that 50% TDN is the requirement for lactation um, and 64% of the TDN requirement for lactation with twins, 11 and 15%. We can see that the density of TDN and crude protein is high if the um, mothers are supporting twins uh, during, during lactation. So yes, this is the basic slide. The take home point from these last couple of slides is that during the later part, during the lactation, if the moms are supporting more than one offspring, we need to provide them a higher nutrient density rations. We cannot provide the same rations uh, as we're providing to mothers that are supporting just one offspring. So the nutritional management in use uh, of breeding age, how does this nutrition changes? It changes the ovulation rate. Uh, the nutrition that we are uh, providing to these uh, animals, it also changes the early pregnancy embryo survival, the mid-pregnancy period of placental growth, and the late pregnancy fetal growth development, colostrum supply, and the mammary development. So we have heard about flushing in our different presentations. And this is just a redundant uh, that because the definition has been covered earlier, but flushing is a temporary, but purposeful elevation of plane of nutrition around breeding time to boost ovulation, conception, and the embryo implantation rate. And I think we had a question yesterday on what is more important. Energy is more important during flushing or protein is more important. So this was a study that came out in 2000, and they were looking at the energy status of these animals. So on the x-axis, on this graph, you can see this is the hours after last feeding. So this is zero all the way to 76 hours. You can see that initially, and on the y-axis, we have this luteinizing hormone that helps with ovulation. 
right after feeding, you can see that there's a pulsatile variation in the luteinizing hormone, and this is very normal. But as animals are fasted, as the animal's body senses that not enough energy is available for them, this pulsations of luteinizing hormone goes down. And that has an eventual impact on the ovulation. And that is the reason we need to make sure that at this point, animal's body senses that there is enough energy stored present in the body to make sure that they can ovulate normally. Now, based on the research studies we have seen, and this is just an average number, that lambing crop or the kidding rates improve by 10 to 20% with flushing. Now, what are the lambing, uh, lambing crop and the kidding rates? Is the number of lambs or the kids born at the farm divided by number of ewes or does. So there's a consistent improvement in 10 to 20% with flushing. Now, what are the considerations uh, with this pre-breeding nutrition? So increasing nutrition primarily, um, mostly focused on energy for as little as four to five days can improve ovulation in underfed ewes. But this is the absolutely minimal requirement. Okay, we have to start that four to five days before the breeding season. However, the recommendations are, for the use, we have to start flushing at least two weeks before breeding. And for the dose, it, it is around three to four weeks before breeding. And again, these recommendations are based on some of the research studies that are conducted across the board, um, regardless of the breeds. Um, that if we start two weeks before um, breeding in use, it will have a maximal impact on the ovulation. Or three to weeks, uh, three to four weeks before breeding in dose, it will have maximal impact. Now, what is most important that use and dose should be in the positive energy balance prior to mating uh, that increases the tendency to ovulate in these underfed animals. Fat use that has body condition score of greater than or equal to four shows little response to pre-breeding energy boost than thin use that has body condition score of less than or equal to two. Now the concept of flushing started from the animals that were range fed, that were out grazing low quality grasses. Because the body condition score of these animals was very low and when they went to the breeding season, they could not conceive well, they could not ovulate well. And that was the reason the energy status of these animals had to be bumped up so that body condition score improved and breeding season is successful. So that's how uh, the concept of flushing initiated. Now, if the body condition score of these animals is around four, these are like borderline obese or in the obese category, the efficacy of flushing is, doubt, uh, is doubtful. While some studies have seen some effect, most of the studies have not seen much effect on the ovulation and the conception. Now, how do you provide these extra energy during, the, during uh, flushing? The rule of the thumb that I think most of the farms follow is 0.5 to one pound of grain per animal per day. Now, these grains that have been used most commonly are corn, barley, wheat, oats, milo, um, but one thing which is very important here is that, um, yes, we can feed them at, 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 as, as high as one pound of grain, but um, the gradual adaptation is required. That is, we cannot uh, feed one pound the very next day um, because the rumen will not be in a good health and animals might be acidotic. That might have consequences on reduction of intake. One thing is also very important is adequate bunk space is required if we are providing grains. Because the bunk space is smaller and with a lot of animals, there might be possibility that some animals consume more grains and the rumen health is compromised on those animals. So we need to have an adequate bunk space. We need to make sure that the feed is distributed, uh, spread uniformly. So every animal gets uh, their own share. High protein feeds have been tried as well. Like I know that I mentioned earlier that proteins um, is not a priority for flushing, but high protein feeds have been tried mostly in those animals that are protein deficient. But whenever we are providing high protein feeds, we need to make sure that we do, we try to avoid legumes, the fresh legumes. 
like fresh alfalfa, clovers, which is bird's foot trefoil. And the reason is because they contain estrogen-like compounds and that might interfere with the reproductive physiology. Legume and grass hay does not have this estrogenic effect. So hays are okay, but fresh uh, legumes, we try to avoid doing flushing. We can mix legume and the grasses, but 100% uh, legumes uh, are not recommended. Before we go for pre-breeding, there are some considerations. We have to look at the herd makeup. When I say herd makeup, we need to make sure that what kind of body condition score we have on, on our animals. If the body condition score for some animals are on the thin side, they need more flushing. But if the body condition score of some animals are on the obese side, we need to exclude them from flushing. So probably it is a better idea to group these animals so that we provide these uh, high energy diets to animals that actually need it. If adding grains are not feasible, because some of these grains are expensive, if it is not feasible, then a good quality pasture can be set aside for breeding or flushing. And again, legume pastures should be avoided. One thing that I have borrowed from our forage presentation is this forage production chart. And this is specific uh, to our Florida conditions. On the, on the uh, uh, x-axis, we have months from January to December. And then these, this graph will show what kind of forages are, uh, can grow at what time of the year. So warm season perennials from April to uh, September to October, stockpile forages, small grains, rye grass and clover, and warm season animals. Now, why is this graph important? because this provides us the information on what kind of forages can exist at our farm at what stage of the year. And it helps us with planning. It helps us with planning breeding, lambing or kidding, and also at what stage animal will be lactating. So we know what kind of inventory we have at our farm. We know what kind of nutrients are available at our farm. And it's very easy to formulate our diets because we know what's coming, we know what's there. So I'll just give an example. So this is the energy requirement for you that is 176 pounds. And these ewes are lambing in January. So on this axis, we have months starting from January all the way to December. This is the lambing. Um, and then we can see this is the weaning phase. And then these are all the requirements. Now, if I superimpose my grasses, my forages, this is how it looks like. Sorry. Now, I know that at what time point I will have the maximum availability of forages for my farm. And at what time point there are maximum requirements. Am I coinciding with the more forage availability and more requirements? If we can do that, I think we can formulate a very good quality diet for our animals. But if we fail to do that, if we, if we don't do it, then probably we need to spend more money on our supplements. We need to buy more concentrates and premixes. So this is just first example. And again, the second example is a spring lambing. Um, this is how the requirements look like. And again, if I superimpose, it is very easy for me to figure out which forage will be available for my animals and at what stage. So I highly recommend uh, that we talk to a forage extension specialist and um, look at these options. What are the options for forages at my farm? And what month my animals are lambing? And just look at the requirements and see if we can use our forages because this is the cheapest, quality, cheapest source of nutrients for us. Look if we can use this forage base to supply adequate nutrients for our animals. One thing which is very important is we need to analyze our forages. And this is, I, I don't know, every presentation, I just try to emphasize this point um, that if we have uh, forages quality available with us, it is very easy to analyze our, uh, to formulate our diets. And these are the labs uh, that we have used. Um, this is in no way we are uh, saying that you should use only these labs, but we have used these labs and they are they have the quality control is excellent. Um, 
So if needed, the forage samples can be sent to one of these labs and um, the results will be quite uh, strong that we can rely upon. But this is very important. We need to know the forages, the type of forages, and we need to know the quality of these forages. So just take a sample uh, from the forage base and send to one of these labs and get them analyzed. So what are the expectations with the pre-breeding nutrition? Well, we expect that there should be 25% increase in um, our uh, lambing um, crop or the kidding rates. There are some studies where they have seen 57% improvement uh, in the lamb crop. And this is the study that came out from Michigan State. So again, the responses are out there. Um, it just, we need to make sure that we are providing the group that needs more uh, nutrients. Flushing response may be lost if ease use goes to the negative energy balance in early pregnancy. We just don't have to drop our ball, right? So once we finish the flushing phase, once animals conceive, there's a totally different set of nutrient requirements. So we need to make sure that we meet those requirements as well, because early pregnancy is one of the most risky stage of losing pregnancy. You have done great job with flushing these animals. You have done great job with ovulation. And now the conception is successful. We need to make sure that the pregnancy is maintained. And at that point also, uh, the nutrition is important. If we lose these early pregnancy, every gain that we had during flushing is lost. So these are the um, nutritional targets, um, 50 to 100% increase in energy intake over maintenance for about two to three weeks. Um, we expect improvement in the body condition score of 0.5 units during this period, which is equivalent to seven to 10, uh, seven to 10 pounds. Sheep um, or goats have to be in the positive weight gain. Increase or decrease flushing length based on the condition score. If, if uh, the animals that we are working with have a condition that is very poor, probably it makes sense to start flushing earlier, but the condition is okay around 3 to 3.5. We can start uh, maybe two weeks earlier and then animals will still be fine. In the grazing system, we have to correct stocking rate and the forage quality has to be measured as well. Uh, flushing, as I mentioned earlier, can be done precisely with energy supplements like corn, barley, and if grains are not available, we can use quality forages. But still, we need to make sure that after flushing, the early pregnancy nutrition is also more effective and we maintain that diet formulation for early pregnancy. Post-breeding uh, flushing, this is an area where we still are working to find out our guidelines. What is the best phase? What is the best time where we can take the flushing diet out of the ration? Now, right now, the recommendation is four weeks, but I've seen studies where they have taken out as soon as uh, one week. They just remove the flushing nutrition, but the recommendation is four weeks um, uh, with, in a flock with a low body condition score. The reason why we go with four weeks because if animals have conceived, then this four weeks gives them a time span where they can have good nutrition um, and they can maintain the early pregnancy. Consequences of the poor nutrition, um, Catalina already mentioned some of these like pregnancy toxemia with underfeeding, milk fever, weaker lambs, neonatal mortality. Again, um, we cannot overemphasize the importance of nutritional at different stages. And overfeeding also has some problems with dystocia, more prone to prolapse, oversized lambs with greater mortality, and it's expensive. So we just don't want to waste our resources. So this is my last slide where I'll quickly show a very simple example on how we can formulate a diet once we know the feeds that are available to us. So this is the value that I've taken from NRC book that I showed you earlier. So we are formulating a diet for a breeding ewe that weighs either 132 pounds or 154 pounds. The dry matter intake for these animals that is recommended is 2.53, 2.86 pound, which is equal to 1.92% of the body weight or 1.85% of the body weight. So let's just focus on body weight that is 154 pounds. Let's focus on just these numbers. 
So the TDN requirement in pounds is 1.52 pounds. The crude protein requirement is 0.218 pounds. Now this is all given in the book, okay? At our farm, we have just these two feeds available, the Bermuda grass hay and then the corn grain. Now, the reason I mentioned that we should send our forage sample for analysis because the analysis will give us the TDN and the crude protein values from these forages. So I have these values. So I know that the dry matter percent of Bermuda grass hay is 89, 11% is water. Corn green is 88%, 12% of water. This is what is given. Now the TDN component is 53% for Bermuda grass hay and corn green is 88%, crude protein is 10% from the hay and 9% from the corn grain. This is what we have. Now we need to make a diet so that I can provide this much of TDN and this much of crude protein. And I'll show you two examples. This is my very first example, okay? I am feeding 3.2 pounds of hay and there is no grain in the diet. With this 3.2 pounds of Bermuda grass hay, I'm providing 1.51 pounds of TDN and 0.28 pounds of crude protein because I know the composition here, right? So I know that with 3.2 pounds, dry matter intake is 2.85. I know how much of energy and protein is coming from hay. There is nothing coming from corn, so this is all zero. So let's see how much of the total nutrients supplied from these two sources, 1.42, but my requirement is 1.52. I'm missing on TDN. 0.27 is total nutrients coming from crude protein. The requirement is 0.22. I'm doing good on my protein, not a problem, but my TDN is less. And for breeding animals, TDN is more important, right? Because animals will be sensing the energy status of the body. My second diet has a corn grain that half a pound of corn grain I have added in the diet. Now there is some TDN coming from corn, there is uh, crude protein coming from corn. Now we can see that the TDN is 1.57 pounds. This is closer to the requirement that is 1.52 pounds. So we are meeting the TDN requirement. We are also meeting the crude protein requirement. So what we have done, just with forage, I have added 0.5 or half a pound of uh, corn grain and I made sure that the energy is met and I made sure that the protein is met. And again, the reason I say that this is a very basic calculation is because we are only formulating diets for protein and energy, but the minerals is a different ballgame. So again, the next step would be hopefully in our future conferences, we can have a presentation on the mineral nutrition on how to balance the mineral, minerals of our diet. But hopefully this gives you an idea on how we can balance for energy and protein with the available resources we have on the farm. Okay, just to uh, summarize, increasing plane of nutrition two to three weeks before breeding can improve lamb and kid crop. We have seen multiple studies and we have seen good success rate. Grains or improved pasture can be used for providing higher plane of nutrition. Body condition score is essential managemental practices for assessing the adequacy of feeding program. We need to know what body condition score of animals are in. If they're very thin, we need to change the flushing uh, period if they are okay, adequate. We need to have just two weeks of flushing and we are fine. Analyzing forage is key to effective diet formulation. And trust me, it goes a long way. It saves so much money and in terms of properly utilizing our nutrients. Um, that's it from my side. This is my email. Uh, so please feel free to send any questions from this email. Um, the notes that I have provided, um, the PDF version, I have also provided some slides on the body condition scoring, but because of time limitation, I could not go through that, but I highly encourage you to go through some of these uh, PDF notes on the body condition scoring, because this is one of the very important tool for, um, for looking at the nutrition adequacy. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll be very happy to answer any question. Anybody that wants to ask questions, you can unmute your, unmute your mics and uh, ask away. We had a comment on the live feed of a Facebook uh, talking about multi-species feeding and taking into account the different requirements for multi-species that, that are usually uh, penned together and offer the same uh, ration. 
Can you comment a little bit on that? Yes, and I think uh, it is very common in our Florida conditions as well. We have seen a lot of farms with multiple species. Um, what I can suggest is that um, if possible, um, we have to have different groups at the farm because if you're just feeding one ration, um, there is a possibility that we are underfeeding or overfeeding some groups. Um, I know that during some situations it is not possible, uh, but it is still uh, important to be cognizant that what we are providing to these animals, what kind of nutrients we are providing to these animals, and are we overfeeding and are we underfeeding? So I, I do not have a recommendations for multiple species, unfortunately, but because I can only suggest that if grouping is possible, please group them and feed them accordingly so that we know what kind of nutrients we're providing to these different groups. But other than that, yeah, I, I don't have much to say. Anybody else has any questions or comments for Dr. Bias? That's the way now. Can't believe Luis doesn't have a, a question. He always raises his hand. So. I mean, I can ask something. Uh, if you, <laughs> I was wondering, um, can you help uh, local farmers uh, to formulate, uh, I mean, I guess you can, but to formulate a a nutrition diet and specifically um, with low cost uh, ingredients. Very valid point, Louise, and uh, I agree that this is much needed. What we have done um, last year is that we have rolled out an app for the dairy producers um, that we are working with. That is the least cost ration formulation. So we have provided the Newton database um, and then we use some algorithms so that the app provides the least cost diet based on the ingredients available and is still meeting the energy and the protein requirements. And so we have done for dairy and I think our next step should be for our sheep and goat producers. And uh, so for now, uh, we are working on the Excel based diet formulation. I'm trying to use the same concept which we can post on our websites and it is freely available to, should be freely available to our producers soon, where my goal is to have the prices of forages, the grains, and then use some algorithms to prepare a least cost diet. It is much needed. Um, unfortunately, we do not have it right now, but this should be coming soon in the future, the Excel-based and the ration formulation app for our producers. Okay, um, um, knowing that, uh, I suggest that in the future, uh, if you can make a workshop uh, for the producers so they can actually learn how to use those uh, certain apps, that will be great. Oh, yeah, sound, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. When, in these apps that you have, do you have a requirement, the minimum requirements in there, like for, for fiber and whatnot, so that you don't overload with uh, high concentrates and not have the fiber to go with it? Yes. Uh, so, um, so, so your question is, do we have the fiber requirements, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, we do have the fiber requirements and I'm just following the NRC. Um, and uh, NRC provides the TDN requirements and the crude protein requirements, but then we know how much fiber is required for maintaining human health. So we have to have a minimum quantity of those fibers. So we are including that in the nutrient requirement tables so that the diets that we formulate does not include fiber that is around 50 or 60% of the diet that animals cannot consume and does not provide less fiber than what is adequate the animals are acidotic. So yes, we do take into account the fiber requirements. But when I say fiber requirements, we go for the minimum level. Um, so for example, for our lactation diets, our minimum level of fiber is 30%. And so we are looking at 30% of NDF in the diet. If it is below 30%, uh, it is it is a lot of concentrates that we're adding. So we try to add more forages. And the maximum level that we go for lactation diets is around uh, 50%. That is the maximum. So we are using some of these thresholds to formulate our diets. Uh, we do not have the requirement for uh, a specific physiological state. We just go by the numbers where the rumen health is, is good. I, I hope that helps. Thank you. 
see. Yes. Awesome. All right. Uh, last call for questions. I'm going to wrap this up. Um, if anybody has any questions now or email Dr. Baez, right? All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing your slide and uh, remind everybody about filling out our survey. Survey uh, link is located on the chat box. Also, it is, okay, that has a question here. Uh, we have a small herd and have been providing, uh, I'm going, uh, and growing forages, banana leaf, moringa, mulberry, uh, Mexican, which oh, Mexican sunflower, and more. Um, so he's talking about uh, growing different forages and cutting and carrying, I guess, for 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 his herd. Do you have any comments on that? Um, yes. Uh, are they providing any um, greens with the diet? Okay. Uh, I, sorry. So yes, it is. It is. Uh, that is. That is what I'm interested to know. But based on the the species that is mentioned, banana leaf, moringa, mulberry, sunflower. I think uh, they might be lacking protein in their diet if they are feeding this these species. So that's why I think adding some uh, grains um, with some protein sources would be good uh, for the herd. And again, um, I think uh, if this is what uh, they want to use in future, um, please analyze them so that we know that how much of energy and protein we are getting from these forages and what is the quality of these, these forages. And that will help them find out what exactly they are lacking. But based on this, I, I think they should provide some protein supplement with the, with the diet. Yeah, we got, we got plenty of resources that you have shared with us. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that Dan can go on the slide set and then work on the, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lab uh, for its analysis. And that, that's, that's gonna be the first step. Okay, so going back to our, uh, our evaluation, you're welcome, Dan. Uh, feel this evaluation, please. This is going to be what is going to drive what we're going to uh, have planned for the near future. So you can either use your phone like Joe is doing, uh, scanning the QR code or typing in the, the uh, uh, code that I just gave you on the chat box. So if you scroll up, uh, it's probably gone by now from your screen, but it's, it's there. You can, you can tap it and you can go and, uh, and do that evaluation. It's going to ask you, you know, several questions, nothing too invasive, uh, but we do need that information for us to be able to provide you uh, with a better quality program for next year that is going to be relevant for you. I appreciate all the speakers uh, taking their, their time to give me the, uh, 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 develop these talks, also uh, upload their presentation so we have them instantly. Uh, right after the, the, uh, the only thing that I'm missing right now is going to be the, the, this session's recording, which we're going to have, you know, by the end of the day. And, and you can go to the website and, uh, and pick it up. The website address is also uh, shared in the, in the chat box. You can go to our Facebook page. And uh, if you go on the about button there, uh, middle way under the profile picture, you can go there uh, to our 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 website address as well. Um, so again, uh, I appreciate you all for being here. Um, this is uh, a non-traditional uh, uh, conference. Every year we usually have a live person uh, with uh, hands-on uh, animals that we can do demonstrations for you and stuff like that. So um, I, I, I appreciate you taking care of, uh, you know, coping with technology and, and COVID challenges. With that, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're dismissed uh, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll see you in the near future.